Welcome to this video where we look at the role administrators play in looking after the non-medical aspects of the Unisoft software. We also explain how to address issues you might encounter whilst the software is being used. And there is also a corresponding video that shows endoscopists how to complete an endoscopy report. There is only one user who controls how the software is to be configured for the Trust or Health board, and that user's login is admin. Now, the default password is also admin and must be changed for security reasons as soon as the software has been installed. Admin can create other administrators, but they will not be able to change the fundamental configuration of the software. So, admin's password needs to be known to only the one or two senior consultants or managers of the system. When admin logs into the software, these are the options that appear under the configure menu. This is showing version 14 of the software, the NED compliant release. Previous versions will have the same options, but they are shown in a different order. You can see in the first two sections how different functions can be enabled and configured. Then there are a series of options that change how the software operates and which options need to be switched on. Unisoft will have taken admin through these various options when the software was first installed. So now, let's look at the configure options for regular administrators. When any user logs in, including administrators, all of the main configuration options are not visible. There are just two options. There's the startup configuration and the image capture configuration. We will look at the first option, in other words, how the opening screen starts up any time someone logs in. There are two tabs at the top of the screen. One is for the startup options on this PC and the other is for the startup options for this particular login. Now if both login configurations are different then a message will appear when the user next logs in asking which one you want to apply, your own or the PC startup. Now there are three main options for determining how the software starts up. The default is by loading the list of patients for all procedures with the most recent downloaded at the top of the list. You can change these defaults so that, for example, they only display the last so many patients or those added since a certain date or those added in the last so many months. However, it is more popular to have the screen displaying search criteria. This prompts the user to enter either a case note number, a medical record number or surname and should be used in the endoscopy rooms as this reduces the risk of selecting a wrong patient. If you have the scheduler enabled you will see this option. You can automatically have the diary page for today being displayed for endoscopists to work off their work list. So here's what the opening screen looks like when you choose Begin by prompting for search criteria. That covers the configuration menu. So now let's look at the administrator utilities. This menu is enabled if admin or an administrator is logged in. It will be greyed out if a regular or read-only user is logged in. These are the entries for the administrator utilities. The first entry allows you to set the software timeout for the particular PC. What this means is that if there has been no activity when the software is left at the opening screen, the software will automatically log that person out. This function comes into play as commonly happens if the endoscopist is not logged out of the software before going to lunch. The software will automatically log the person out. You can see that the default is 45 minutes but if this PC is in x-ray for example where ERCPs are carried out the time can be increased. The second entry on the administrator utilities menu is add edit login details but before we look at this let me explain. Everyone who needs access to the GI reporting tool needs to be given a login. This includes managers, endoscopists, nurses, booking clerks, coders, etc. etc. 
Some of these logins will be for members of staff who actually attend endoscopies. So there's an entry in the Administrator Utilities menu for adding staff members. There is also one final entry. This is for adding and editing the referring consultants, many of whom may not require logins. OK, so back to the screen. This is the entry for adding logins. Each login will belong to one of the three categories, administrators, regulars or read-onlys. Clicking on the headings sorts the list in alphabetical order. You can switch on and off the yeses and noes just by clicking on them. If you click on the no for regular rights, for example, it'll switch that to yes and change the administrator rights to no. Note that there are two further columns, Modify Tables and Delete Patients. The first is for those users allowed to add text to the drop-down boxes found throughout the software. If that is a no, the user will only be able to pick entries from the drop-down list. They won't be able to add anything. The second item is important and cannot be changed unless you are logged in as admin. Those who are allowed to delete patients from the database can also delete patient reports. So, for security reasons, the only person allowed to change these permissions is admin. No one else can. Finally, the rightmost column shows those currently logged in. The first button of four is Add New User. When you click on a login, the remaining three buttons become enabled. Firstly, we'll look at adding a new user. Note that there are sufficient examples to explain what needs to be entered. And also note, there is nothing about their password in this box. Only when this user logs in for the first time will they create their own password. So, the first field is the user's name. The next thing is their login ID. And Contrary to this example, please use their regular NHS or Trust login. There is no reason to create yet another login that has to be remembered by the poor user. Next is their access rights, read only, regular or administrator. The default is regular. The next box allows you to say whether the user can add to or modify the drop down boxes or not. Note that the bottom checkbox, can delete patients from the database, is greyed out because admin did not log into this software. As already said, only admin can set or change this permission. Next, we're going to look at system usage. This tells you who is logged in and who is working on which patient records. This is a useful screen if, for example, the software has stopped abruptly. It may still show a user as being logged into a patient record, not allowing others to access it. If that happens, you can click on the lock record and click Unlock Record. The next entry on the Administrator Utilities menu is System Usage Reports. This is a legacy from earlier versions of the software and much of this functionality has been replaced by the audit log under the reports menu. Then the next entry is NHS number validation. This is for those very few hospitals without a PAS interface. It allows you to view and change the details for patients either with invalid, old or missing NHS numbers. The next entry is for the registration details. This allows you to change the heading on the report, the trust type, the report subheading and the department name and that latter item only appears in the splash screen at login. The next entry are the database functions. Again, this is a legacy from older versions of the software and may not be enabled for your trust. The next entry is Change the Station ID. This is the location of the PC and adjacent telephone number. This is so that the software can tell a user that a patient's record is locked by so and so and on which PC. It's important to note each PC must have its own unique ID to prevent users getting an unexplained message saying they've been logged out by a user with administrator rights. 
Now we come down to the other important entries. The first of these is the inline tutorial. These are the red instruction windows that appear when endoscopists enter reports. After a while these will become unnecessary and can be switched off for the user and for particular procedures. Again, you can click the headings of the columns to switch them into alphabetical order. Just point and click to switch a yes to a no and vice versa. The next is modifying drop-down lists. You cannot add items to the lists in this screen. This must be done within the actual drop-downs to make sure that you've added entries to the right list. What you can do here, though, is suppress items from appearing in the drop-down list for all new reports. If you go back to previous reports, you will still see all entries in the drop-down boxes. In the top half of the screen, you choose the prompt that appears beside the drop-down box, and the entries appear in the lower half. You can suppress and unsuppress entries by double-clicking on them. The next entry allows you to manage the list of referring consultants. The referring consultant is the primary physician who will be responsible for the patient in the secondary or tertiary sector. You don't need an entry in here for a GP referral. When a patient is referred to the hospital by a GP, then the referring consultant will actually be the primary physician who reports the findings and outcomes back to the patient's GP. Given many patients who will be referred by a GP directly to endoscopy, you will need to include in this group of referring consultants the primary gastroenterologists in the department. Of course, the other referring consultants to be added to this list will be those from other hospitals. Here you can see a few referring consultants. You see their specialty and which hospital they belong to. First point to note is the top line. You can set the order by which you want the referring consultants to be displayed in the drop-down boxes on the patient demographic screen. You can have them in very strict alphabetical order, or ordered in alphabetical order of surname, or you can have the list displayed with the most frequent referrers at the top. Beneath that, you can filter the list of consultants to see whether one has already been added. These are the four main buttons on this screen. Let's look at adding a new consultant. You begin by entering their title. Next, you add their forename, their surname is in blue as it is an obligatory field. Next, optionally, you enter their GMC number and then their specialty and if it's not in the drop down list you can add it by clicking this button. Finally, you need to say which hospital they're based at. Now click Save. You can edit any of the details by clicking on the consultant's name. Please note that you cannot change the name once it has been added. If you've made a mistake in the spelling of the name, then you must click the Suppress Consultant button. Now that we've finished, we'll close down this window and move on to the next item in the Administrator Utilities menu. This is to do with maintaining the list of drugs. We differentiate between drugs prescribed for treatment and those used by the endoscopist during the procedure. Both lists work in the same way, so we'll choose the pre-meds. Here you can see the pre-slash-perioperative drugs already on the system. There are two buttons, Modify Drug and Add Drug. Note that alfentanil is not in the list, so let's add it. We add the name. We don't click the box for reversing agent. We select the units micrograms in this case. The box labelled other is for other such things as gel. Then we set the default dose and by what increments the spin up and spin down buttons will respond to. 
Then there's the delivery method. And again, other can be something like spray, enema or topical. And finally, you click the procedures it can be used in. We now click Add and we can see that this has been entered into the list. We'll close this window and now go to the penultimate entry, Add Edit Staff Members. Here's a list of the staff who work and assist in the endoscopies. As with previous screens, you can sort the columns alphabetically by clicking on the column names. Because this is the NED compliant version, GMC numbers are obligatory for all endoscopists and NMC numbers for nurse endoscopists. Above the column headings is a box that allows you to search for names in the list. There are four buttons at the bottom left, all of which are enabled when you click on a name above. So let's look at adding a new staff member. Enter the details in normal case, not all in capitals, as this is how you want the details to appear in the report. Also, take care in entering the details as you cannot delete a staff member once added into the database. You can only suspend them from that list. If the person's role does not appear in the drop-down box, then click Add New Title. Then select whether they are endoscopists or nurses. In this example, because the database covers more than one hospital, you need to select the appropriate location for the staff member. Then click Accept. The new staff member is added. So now let's look at editing a staff member. Let's say that Dr. Sangster is made up to a consultant and he's based at just one of the hospitals. Note, you cannot change his name. If a mistake had been made, then all you can do is suppress this staff member from appearing and re-enter him. You can add his qualifications, change his role, add him now as a list consultant and remove one of the current locations. Then click Accept. The other two buttons in the underlying screen are self-explanatory. Finally, the last item is adding and editing endoscopes. As with the other screens, you can click on the column headings to sort the list into alphabetical order based on the entries in that column. Here's an interesting point. Because the scopes are always displayed in strict alphabetical order in the procedure screens, it is best to begin the instrument with the number the instrument is commonly known by. Then follow that with a model number and finally with a serial number. Even do this for loan scopes, so let's add one now. Here, the word loan is being added in brackets after the unique identifier. Also shown is this is for OGDs and is only available at this one hospital. Then click Accept. If a scope is no longer used, then edit it and it can be suppressed from appearing in future drop-down lists. That brings us to the end of this tutorial for administrators. There's an accompanying video for endoscopists who are new to Unisoft and shows the basics about compiling reports. Thank you for watching this video.